to playoff season here um, in Southern California. For those who aren't familiar with me, my name is James Williams. I am a assistant sports editor for the Orange County Register and the Southern California News Group. Uh, we've been doing a weekly series with some of our Southern California News Group reporters uh, each week here on Twitter Spaces. And this week is no different. We have MLB reporter J.P. Hornstra, who's been covering the league since I've been working for the company. And that's been at least nine years. J.P., how you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. You, uh, <laughs> you, you, you got there fairly close to the beginning of my time as an MLB reporter. Did I? You didn't miss my That first okay. year was rough, man. Don't worry. You didn't miss anything. <laughs> <laughs> that was your rookie season. They, they, you know. That, that was. Yeah. Um, so let's get started. So, so big news today, obviously, as expected, you know, the roster comes out. Um, we find who's in, who's out. Um, any immediate takeaways before we kind of dive a little bit deeper, but just what kind of stood out to you? I know Kimbrell was probably one of the things that was maybe expected. Yeah, Kimbrell was expected, but until you see it in writing, it's still not necessarily something that you are sure of just because – especially in the playoffs, teams really value veteran experience and, and not like for no reason either. I think mm-hmm. that the the more baseball I cover, wouldn't have known this as a rookie, but the more baseball I cover, the more I see the value of postseason experience play out mm-hmm. on, on, you know, in, in at-bats, like uh, in, in, in pitches where – the more experienced player just seems to have a keener sense of the moment and doesn't let it overwhelm him than, than the rookie. And would that have been enough to get Craig Kimbrell a postseason roster spot, even though he's had a really tough, rough few months here uh, leading into October? Um, ultimately, the answer was no, but you don't necessarily know that until the roster comes out. So um, interesting to see that, if nothing else. Um, the other two spots that at least to me could have gone differently were um, Caleb Ferguson was left off the roster. Uh, left-hander finished the regular season with an ERA under two, which mm-hmm. is impressive. Um, more recently, though, if, if you kind of look at his performance on a head-to-head basis with the other guys down in the bullpen, there were some command things that I think Ferguson could have tightened up and that I know he was working to tighten up because we could see him working with the pitching coaches before the game and the bullpen and whatnot. Um, So there was something there. And the only pitfall of that is now you've only got one lefty, one one real lefty reliever, and that's Alex Bessia, who's been very good this season. But beyond that, you're, you're counting on you're probably going to count on some right-handers to get some left-handers out, hopefully not in too big of moments. Um, Andrew Heaney is a left-hander too, but it's not really clear. I, he's probably going to be more of a bulk reliever. He's, he's really a reliever in name only. He, he would be starting if the Dodgers felt better about him getting the Padres one, two, three hitters out. Um, so that was you know, somewhat interesting. And, and, and then finally, Miguel Vargas, the rookie who got called up late in the season, ended up getting the final position player roster spot over mm. Hanser Alberto, the veteran who had been with the team all year, signed as a free agent last off season. I, 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 I use this term with the most fondest of affection, but he was kind of more like a mascot than like an actual <laughs> contributing member of the bench. He, his season highlights are really him like dancing in the dugout and cheering on his teammates and pitching in blowout, usually blowout wins, um, more so than him like getting big hits. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess from that standpoint, it wasn't that surprising. But again, you talk about veteran experience trumping rookie success, and it's not like Miguel Vargas was hitting out of his, his cleats either. Like He'd had some ups and downs, and in the aggregate, there had been more downs than ups. Um, having said that, like I think he was the organizational player of the year, I think Baseball America gave him that honor. Um, so he had a very good AAA season. He's a guy who's paid his dues in the minor leagues coming here from Cuba. Um, so it, it's not that there's no precedent for success, just not a lot at the major league level. So that was interesting to me. Uh, and we talk about Julio. I know there's been, you know, you don't have Walker Bueller available at the moment. Uh, Kershaw is kind of, 
whether I don't know if he's fully accepted or not, but he's kind of taking that game two role in these series. You have Julio starting game one. Um, what are your expectations for Julio in game one? Um, it, I think it's going to be interesting, not just with Julio, but with all the starting pitchers to see mm-hmm. how long of a leash they get. Will Dave Roberts let any of his starting pitchers face the Padres hitters three times? I, I, I'm, I've given up on four. I don't think that's going to happen in the playoffs. Um, but will he let the opposing? Uh, will he let his starting pitchers face any of the opposing hitters three times? I, I think Julio gets that leash at least to an extent. Um, he's a guy who intentionally will throw his fastball 90, 91, 92 at the start of a game, and then by the time he's in the fifth or sixth inning, it's up to ninety four, ninety five plus. Um, that's kind of how he paces himself and that's how he works through the opposing lineup. Give them a little something extra to think about, um, make them tighten up that reaction time every time they face him. And it's been very effective. I mean, he might win the Cy Young award this year. He already won an ERA title. I think that is a formula that can carry over to the postseason, but somewhat, uh, counter effectively pitchers starting pitchers tend not to pitch deep into the game so i don't know how many 95 mile per hour fastballs the padres are going to see from julio Arias today um the other thing the you know like you said clayton kershaw starting game two ostensibly maybe the biggest reason for that is because they don't expect clayton kershaw to be able to come back and pitch meaningful innings in game five if there is a game five Mm -hmm. Uh, he's somebody who you really want to let him have all of the rest that is available to right. him and not have a short time between outings. So will the idea of bringing Julio back on short rest in game five bear into his workload today? Probably not. I think the Dodgers are probably thinking let's win game one and let Julio go as long as it takes to win game one rather than let's, you know, in the back of our minds, bank on there being a game five and, and pull Julio Arias early so he has a little more left in the tank five days from now. I, I don't think that's the calculus today. Um, and speaking of Walker Buehler, correct me if I'm wrong, I think I saw something where, uh, okay, he's not pitching in a series more or less, he's not ready, but he's going to be like doing a ceremonial first pitch or something. Did I read that right? He did. He's doing a ceremonial first pitch before game two. I I've seen a lot of ceremonial first pitches, James, like a lot, but I don't yeah. think I've ever seen like a player on the injured list right. <laughs> of his current team, right. uh, let alone a pitcher who's right. like rehabbing a pitching injury. <laughs> um, are, are, are we going to be judging the progress of his rehab based on how close to the strike zone this is? Are we going to bring out the radar gun? Or, right. or like, what about his spin rate? Are, are we going to be bringing out like, you know, the high speed cameras to like analyze this first pitch. Like what is going to happen here? I don't know. A lot of variables going into this one. It's going to be interesting. Um, <laughs> like what if it goes wrong? What if, what if he, what if he just, you know, I don't know. What if it's a wild pitch or something? Like what if he hurts himself again on the first pitch? Like, I don't know. It doesn't sound like a smart idea. So people watching, you know what I mean? So if, if Bueller weren't such an alpha, I would actually not put this past him, but I, I would love to see him go out there and just underhand it just to troll everybody. (laughs) Just be like, I'm not giving you anything here. I'm just going to underhand it. Just going to float it over the plate. I just wanted to know what the discussion was to even say, yeah, this is a smart idea. Let's do this. Like, yeah. I I mean, mean, how many tickets could it really bring in? You know what I mean? Like how many, how many people are you really bringing in to watch Walker throughout the first pitch? Well, and was he even plan A? part of this in the back of my mind, I can't rule out the idea that they had somebody lined up, probably some big celeb who at the last minute blew the Dodgers off, couldn't commit to it. And they looked around and they were like, all right, who wants to throw it? Bueller's like, you know what? <laughs> let me do it. I want to throw a pitch this postseason. Let me let this be it. Just to say he did. It. Yeah. I mean, best, best, best and most willing candidate um, in the house. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and just moving along, so we it was a best of three series wild card format um, that led to the Padres. You know they got the edge over the Mets. You had a few other series, actually every other series. It looks like it was two zero except for the Mets and the Padres series. Uh, the Padres win that one. Uh, just your thoughts on the format and and the journey there for the Padres to get into this game. 
into the series, excuse me. Yeah. Um, I, you know, credit goes to the Padres because they had a good season, but, and, and even under last year's playoff format, uh-huh. they would have been in the postseason. They would have um, had a shot at reaching this round. But when I think about the new playoff format, the best of three, it really penalizes that team that won the division, but has the worst record of the division winners. It's it's really like, like it makes sense, right? Because we're kind of conditioned to think of ranking teams in terms of their records. And in baseball, you're also conditioned to think in terms of giving the team that wins its division, some sort of priority in the playoff hierarchy. But man, the Mets got screwed. I'm sorry. Like, you win your division, you should not have to survive a best of three first round. You shouldn't have to. Mm-hmm. And in the American League, Cleveland did it. They they survived. They beat Tampa. They beat the wild card team. But in the National League, the best of three format really penalized a team that should have been in the division series round to begin with. Last year, the Padres would have played, um, I guess it would have been the Braves? The Padres would have had to play in. The Padres would have been a wild card team that would have mm-hmm. had to play in uh, to, to, to this round. It would have been a one game playoff. And to me, that that makes just so much more sense, right? It makes so much more sense. Now, it's almost this full scale reversal whereby if you don't have one of the two best records in your league, national or American, you really have a tough road to hoe. Um, in, in that sense, it's almost like it, how it was before the six di- division format. This is inside baseball stuff, James. Tell me if I'm getting too boring, but like, all right, it's good stuff. As, good. as somebody who, as somebody who's, um, you know, been a baseball fan since the eighties and has seen playoff formats evolve and change. Like this isn't the best one, man. This isn't the best one. Kudos to the Padres, but like a best of three series tells me absolutely nothing about how good they are. Like the Mets had the better regular season over 162 games. They got screwed. The Padres got hot at the right time. Good for them. But this was, um, you know, Bob Melvin said it best. They, they feel fortunate to be in this position. He said it, not me. Um, he said that yesterday at his presser. So I'm with you, Bob. I think your Padres are fortunate to be in this position. <laughs> and if I'm not mistaken, I think the Dodgers have, I mean, I think they got the best of everybody this season, but um, I think that it was a significant difference in, in the number of wins in the series, just the season series between the Dodgers and the Padres. Um, it's probably safe to say the Dodgers are the favorite going into this series. They are. I did a little bit of looking into it as of yesterday. Um, they are. They are the betting favorite in uh-huh. Vegas, um, which is not a surprise. They won 111 regular season games, best record in the league, best record in franchise history. Um, if you can't make the Dodgers the favorite in this series, what are you doing? <laughs> um, but the head-to-head season series. So I wrote this in my preview yesterday. The Dodgers won. 14 of the 19 games. They went 14 and 5 against the Padres. Four of those final scores were 8 to 1, 10 to 2, 11 to 2, 12 to 1. Padres have seen a lot of Hanser Alberto pitching in blowouts this year. Um, and then three of the losses, and I think this is actually is important. So the Dodgers lost to the Padres five times, but three of those were extra inning losses where the 10th inning started with a runner on second base. Mm-hmm. And they're not going to have that in the postseason. It's just going to be if the game goes into the tenth inning. There's no, there's no zombie runner. You got to win it fair and square, which I greatly prefer as a baseball fan. <laughs> um, the the Padres aren't going to have that to hold on to, and and I think the Padres do. I think one thing I will say to their credit, they they have guys who are a little bit better situational hitters than the Dodgers. Um, you know, I feel like if you get Max Muncy up there, Max Muncy's going to try to hit a home run. Um, if you get, you know, he, he's kind of the quintessential example, but you know, there are very few guys who are adept at sacrifice bunting and hitting the ball the other way and, um, moving the runner over, you know, Freddie Freeman is great at that. Mookie Betts is great at that when he's on Trey Turner's had a rough last month, but you know, even though he's a very good all around hitter, he can do that. Um, Gavin Lux can do that. He kind of sprays the ball around too, but, 
um, the other five guys on a given night, you know, they're, they're mashers. Um, they, they try to score runs by hitting the ball over the fence and that just doesn't work when you have a power pitcher on the mound and three chances to get a runner over from second base. Like that's not the way to do it. So, um, long story short, I think that's an advantage that went the Padres way three times in the regular season that goes away now. So it, it, to me, even that 14 and five head to head regular season record, it's more lopsided than it looks. Gotcha. And real quick, just on Dustin May, how has he been kind of doing? I think he had a back injury to end the season, but, or was on the injured list, but was dealing with Tommy John prior to that, if I'm not mistaken. What, how has he been looking and, and is it okay to have um, some real expectation for him at this point in the season? I mean, he made um, the wrong. Yeah, it's okay to have some expectation for him, but I'm, I guess I'm not surprised why he made the roster. Like, I get it. He has the best stuff of anybody on the staff when he's healthy. And the six starts that he made, he was healthy. He was recovered from the Tommy John. That, that wasn't the issue. But the, the sort of traditional path back from Tommy John is that, you know, you, you go through the 12 to 18 months of rehab. You come back, you pitch a few games in the minor leagues, then you come back in the major leagues, and typically the guy coming right back from Tommy John isn't as good as he was before the surgery. Mm -hmm. And the really interesting thing with respect to Dustin May is that in three of his starts, he was that guy. Uh, You could argue he was even better because he had a changeup that he was throwing to left-handers that he didn't have before the surgery, really didn't have confidence in it. And it was like, oh, wow, he came back better. This is great. Well, in the other three starts, his command was just not very good at all. And ultimately, he went on the aisle with a back issue. So you have a guy on the roster who's made three good starts, three bad starts, hasn't pitched in a month outside of inter-squad games. He's not going to start for you. Um, at least he's not going to make a full start for you. Mm-hmm. Certainly not this round and maybe not next round either, just because his arm isn't built up having not pitched in a month. So how comfortable is he pitching out of the bullpen? Like, we really don't know. Um, If his command is there, how long of a leash do you want to give him coming out of the bullpen? Do you let him pitch one inning or two or three or four? And if his command isn't there, which it wasn't half the time, how quickly, if you're Dave Roberts, do you just get him out of there and say, all right, I've seen enough? Um, And if that's happening more often than not, why even give him the roster spot? Like that's a bit of a gamble to me. Um, Again, I I get why they made it. It's not like there's no reason to have him on the roster, but that to me was probably the riskiest call. Just not knowing exactly who he's going to be when he gets out there in the game and what role he's going to be in. Gotcha. Uh, We're talking to JP Hornstra here from the orange County register an MLB reporter who's been covering the league for quite some time. Make sure you check his work along with Dodgers beat reporter Bill Plunkett over at ocregister.com. JP, biggest um, maybe surprise or, or give me a surprise team or someone that is maybe you would consider a sleeper to maybe do some damage here um, in the playoffs. Have you seen what the Phillies are doing today? <laughs> <laughs> oh, a game, the games already start. <laughs> yeah, they, they, there's four games going today, and so they've kind of stacked uh, them. Gotcha. Anyway, that is seven to one in the fifth inning. <laughs> now, I, I don't think that the Phillies are that much better than the Braves. I don't think anybody thinks that. But what that does tell me is that maybe that layoff that the Braves had, because the Braves had the second um, – seed in in the postseason so they also did not have to play in that first round the braves um the braves might actually be in trouble here because of that long layoff um yeah can they you know i was talking to sean green about this last week and he was telling me how it's really as a hitter that it just takes you a bit to get your timing back when you haven't faced pitching in a competitive game scenario um in five days because these are baseball players. Their brains are tuned to play every day to see, you know, 95 mile per hour plus fastballs every day. And um, you take that away 
and it takes a little adjustment to get it back. So I think that's probably what you're seeing play out in this game. Having said that, James, it's seven to one in the fifth inning. So I, I think if the Phillies take game one on the road, you you have to give them a little bit more of a chance than you did, you know, three hours ago, uh, let's say. And I think too, like to the discussion about the Dodgers, like is the layoff going to hurt the Dodgers? Similarly, now I've had players, hitters, I've heard hitters say that facing Dodgers pitchers in inter-squad games is just about as good as it gets because these guys have nasty stuff. So if you were playing an inter-squad game and you faced Blake Trinan, for example, like he's one of the best relief pitchers in baseball. He's got a filthy slider, you know, 98 mile per hour fastball when he wants to dial it up. That's pretty good practice. Like that's damn near as good as it gets as being in a game, minus the fans, of course. And will that be enough? I think that's the question. If the Padres race out to a bit of a lead here in game one, I, that wouldn't surprise me just by virtue of the, the, the layoff uh, that the Dodgers have had while the Padres were playing the Mets. Um, but, you know, until we see them catch up, until we see the hitters catch up, until we see the Braves hitters catch up, like we just don't know. Uh, maybe the maybe the Padres are going to be that good. Maybe the Phillies are going to be that good. And, and we're going to see the same things play out here. Uh, game one between the Astros and the Mariners is going to be getting started here pretty soon. Are the Astros going to be similarly affected by this layoff? Guardians versus Yankees is later today. Are the Yankees going to be similarly affected by this layoff? And if so, how much does getting that jump in game one matter to these teams that are coming in as supposed underdogs? Like, I don't know. Um, again, <laughs> he, that best of three wild card round really throws a monkey wrench into the whole traditional baseball playoff operation that I'm I'm not sure that I like. So um, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, you mentioned Sean Green. You do the Believe in Dodgers podcast with him. Um, how's that been going? And, and uh, what have you learned from Sean about the Dodgers that you didn't already know? Because I know you've been covering the Dodgers for some time. Yeah. I would say that like the most interesting thing about that is that you're, you're talking baseball, right? That's the common language, but you're talking about it from the perspective of somebody who sat in the press box for 10 years. Yeah. And he's coming at it from the perspective of somebody who lived and played the game all of his life. Um, all of his professional life in, in Sean's case, it was just like, really good 15 plus year career um <laughs> you know still the all-time single season dodgers home run record holder um that hasn't been broken yet and he's um just got a perspective that i could never right. approach and and i would like to think that there are some things that i see from my view that that he wouldn't understand intuitively either so uh, i think the blending of perspectives is interesting i always learn something from talking to him um <laughs> he he tells me that he learned things from talking to me too um, <laughs> um i'm i'm yeah I, I i i'm lucky to have a hall of fame vote james i don't know that seems like flattery to me but we'll see um no it's been really fun and you learn to be a better extemporaneous speaker because you don't have to do that when you're writing <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, nah, you get time to think about those sentences when you're writing. Um, luckily, you know, podcasting, there's an edit button mm -hmm. on like Twitter. So um, if I screw up now on this live space, it's there in perpetuity, right? Like we can't go back and edit it out. Nope, it's there for the it's there for the the Twitter world to see. Um, with that being said, we'll we'll get you out of here in a couple minutes. Um, Real quick, the Padres are taking it upon themselves to try and block people out of or to block L.A. County folks from going and buying tickets on their site for Padre home games. Um, it, we'll have to wait and see how that ends up turning out, obviously, with the you know secondhand purchases and, and you know, the secondary market and stuff like that. Uh, what are your thoughts, your takeaway on the Padres trying to go above and beyond to sounds like do everything possible to try and make it a home field advantage in favor of san diego yeah it's interesting i've never heard of anything like this um i get why they're doing it 
if you've been to a Dodgers Padres game in San Diego, you know that prior to this year, conservatively, let's say prior to 2020, Mm -hmm. it was at least 50% Dodger fans making the noise. Um, Especially those weekend series where you could just like book a hotel in San Diego, stay and watch two or three games and really make a weekend out of it. Like that's a pretty cool weekend if you're a Dodger fan and there were plenty of good seats available. Um, Last year, I feel like it started to shift a little bit closer to 50-50, maybe more so for uh, the noise going for the Padres in some cases. This year, same. Um, and, and the Padres wanted to stay that way. They, they, don't, want, they don't want Dodger fans crowding it up and, and drowning out the sound of Padres fans cheering for their team in a playoff game. I get it. Um, but I think where the strategy really will reach its verdict is when we see exactly what happens in game three and game four if necessary um i read something yesterday that of all the division series of all the division series games that are for sale the most expensive ticket is game three in san diego now Mm. why is that (laughs) is that because there's just so much demand in san diego to see the padres you know play a meaningful playoff game against the dodgers teams coming off of a big series win against the Mets. There's just this excitement that hasn't been there in, in, you know, more than a decade could be sure. Uh, Could it be that (laughs) uh, fans in, in LA County are going above and beyond and and paying above and beyond to find a way around this restriction (laughs) to cheer their Dodgers in San Diego? Like, I don't know. Um, I really don't know. So I, I, I would guess you could say that from a marketing standpoint, it's working. I mean, we're talking about it, right? Yep. Tickets are expensive, right? Something's working. Um, but will it work to create the atmosphere they're intending? Got to wait a couple of days to find out. Yeah, no, that's a that's a very good point. Uh, the last time me and you talked, we were at Dodger Stadium. It was the All-Star game, I believe. Yeah, we were getting ready for the All-Star game. Yep. And, and I think I asked you about Vince Scully, and I was wondering why he wasn't a part of it. Part of, you know, everything that was going on, obviously, it was about a month or so later. Um, he passes away. Do you have a good Vince Scully story for us? Do I? Okay. Let's see. Where should I start? Um, <laughs> Vince Scully stories. Well, did you know, James, that I explained Twitter to Vince Scully? <laughs> no, I did not know this. I did. This actually seems like the most appropriate forum to, I think to so. share this. Yeah, it's it's a little macabre, but, but just stay with me. So uh, 10 years ago, plus or minus, if not my rookie year, my second year on the beat. And I'm sitting around a dining table in the press box and at Dodger Stadium. And a bunch of writers are there with me. And Vin, like he was always habitually doing before the game he would just go in and say hi to people on his way uh around and he came over to the writer's table i was sitting there molly knight i think was sitting to my left maybe dylan was there the other beat writers were all there and finn comes over says hi to us and we ended up talking about twitter and and molly and i were explaining to him just how to use twitter and i'll never forget what i said to him Um, you know, I was, we were talking about like how, you know, trending topics exist, right. And and people will find out about breaking news by virtue of these trending topics. You know, often reporters will report their scoops first on Twitter and then people will get talking about things. And I said, swear to God, James, I said, one of the most, uh, popular genres of trending topics on Twitter is obituaries. Hmm. When, when people die, Often, the first place the public finds out is on Twitter. That's true. And and here we are, 10 years later. Guess how I found out that Vince Scully had passed away? Yeah. So, uh, all, all comes full circle, but um, I will never forget that one. I have a lot more positive memories about him. Like, we, you know, he gave me a one-on-one interview in spring training one year. Um, it was just me and him talking in the press box at Camelback Ranch for, like, at least 15 minutes. You know, he was, of course, telling stories about the, you know, Dodgers in the early 60s and beating the Yankees in the 63 World Series and like, you know, just full 150 proof Finn Scully for at least 15 minutes. Like, that was great. Um, But yeah, just like a good guy. 
the fact that Vince Scully knew my name is probably one of the highlights of my career. Um, <laughs> for, forget all the other details. The yeah. fact that I did enough to uh, be memorable to somebody who's arguably the most famous broadcaster in the history of the country, um, let alone sports, like just crazy. So got a lot of good Vince stories over the years and uh, it was sad to hear that he passed. And like you said, man, um, you knew it would have taken something big for him not to make the all-star game, uh, make some kind of an appearance there, you know? Yeah, that was probably one of the things that I was looking looking forward to, or maybe whether I realized it or not until I actually got to the press box. Because, again, that the all-star game was the first time I'd ever been in the press box. I'd heard about the ice cream machine and then, you know, the Dodger Dogs and all that stuff. So I was looking forward to that. But then I always kind of heard these stories about how uh, Vin would always kind of make the rounds in the press box before he went into the booth and, and would kind of interact with everybody. So um, I feel like I didn't get the full kind of Dodger media experience uh, without Vince Scully being there, but it was still a fun time regardless. Uh, before we let you go, JP, any final thoughts, um, anything that's kind of running through your mind as you get ready for, for the upcoming game here? Let's see. 6.37 PM start time. Kings opening day is also tonight. Mm-hmm. I mean, they try to schedule these things staggered so the traffic isn't horrible. But, guys, traffic is going to be horrible. Um, <laughs> so get there early if you're planning to go to the game. That 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 should go without saying. Just a yeah. good blanket statement for Dodger, Dodger games. Um, but, no, I think it'll be a fun one. Like I said, this five-day layoff is going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting for all the higher-seeded teams. We are already seeing what it's done to the Braves. So if the Dodgers get off to a slow start, don't panic. You heard it here first. The bats are going to be slow. That's just the way it goes. Awesome. There you go. That's J.P. Hornster for you, reporter for the Orange County Register and the Southern California News Group, and also does the Believe in Dodgers podcast with Sean Green. Thank you so much, J.P. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for everybody who listened to me. Um, (laughs) Yeah, sorry. We don't have an edit button. Apologies. We don't need it, but we did good stuff today. Thank you again, JP. <laughs> Thanks, uh, I'll, James. I'll, I'll be talking to you later, and uh, enjoy the playoffs. You too, man. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope to see you in the next one. Take care, everybody.